Hello, my name's Benjamin Sisko. Welcome to Babylon 5. This was going to be a video about the difference between free software and open source. But as I got into the context for that, uh, I kind of went down a rabbit hole. So now this is a video about the history of Unix and leading into all that stuff that I wanted to talk about. Uh, it's not going to be a comprehensive history. It's going to meander around and concentrate on the things that I find interesting because this is my video. You want to make your own video? That's cool. So the story of, of Unix starts with one of these. This, for our younger viewers, is a telephone. This is what telephones used to look like. This particular telephone is a trim phone. This was designed in the late 60s, uh, in use in the 70s and 80s. So it's kind of around from around the same time as Unix. Uh, it's, it's, this was a pretty cool telephone, and it sounded like this. which is pretty cool because before that, all telephones in Britain pretty much just had a bell that, you know, literally made a ringing noise. Um, and, and, and this was a bit different and a bit cool and a bit cool looking, a bit futuristic and that. Anyway, that's not the point. Unix is the point. So it all starts with this man, Alexander Graham Bell. In 1880, old Alex here was given a prize by the French government for inventing the telephone, which we've already seen. That is a telephone. He was awarded 50,000 francs, which in today's money would be about a quarter of a million dollars, a bit more than that. So quite a lot of money. That was called the Volta Prize. Uh, and with that money, he set up Bell Laboratories, which was supposed to be a sort of design and manufacture place for telephones. Uh, he also founded, well, he founded uh, Bell Telephone Company which very rapidly grew and started buying other telephone companies, nascent telephone companies at the time, including, I think, Western Electric. Uh, they also bought a telephone company called AT&T, but for legal reasons, carried on operating under the AT&T name. So AT&T kind of was the company that owned everything. But this whole structure of companies, it was a massive structure of companies, was known as the Bell System. Uh, the Bell system was operated uh, for a very long time as a regulated monopoly, meaning that the government in America recognized that the company was a monopoly, uh, but rather than breaking it up or trying to stimulate competition, just acknowledged that it's a monopoly, a monopoly and regulated it as such. Uh, in most European companies, uh, countries, something like that, a company that's uh, a monopoly that's operating something for the public good that's just a utility would tend to be nationalized. But this is America, so they didn't do it that way. Uh, and we have like a very big kind of early example of what's often re referred to a, 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 as rentier capitalism. Uh, I'll briefly go into what that means. So... Traditional industrial capitalism involves a capitalist owning a factory, uh, and that factory produces something, say, shoes. I'm not an expert in shoes, so I don't know what shoes are made of. Let's say aluminium and bricks. So the capitalist makes sure that the shoe factory has a constant supply of aluminium and bricks, and it outputs shoes. It has an input, and it has an output. Uh, a renter, for example, a landlord, uh, just uh, owns something. And he gets paid for, he charges a rent because he owns the thing. And that's it. This is a picture representing landlords. I'll make that one bigger. Uh, and rentier capitalism is kind of like that. Because, because uh, the Bell system owned all the phone networks and a lot of the phone companies, uh, they didn't have, there was no input and output. You have to maintain the thing, but there's no input and output. Like in the case of shoes, they just own the thing and they charge for the use of the thing. They're not really... Once it's set up, they're not really doing anything. They're just charging for its use. And this allows them to make an absolute fuck ton of money. And that's what the Bell system did. It made a lot of money. And all of that money had to go somewhere. And one of the places that it went was to Bell Labs. Uh, Bell Labs at the time was funded by a 1% in inverted commas tax on AT&T revenues, which was an absolute mega piss ton of money. Um, and Bell Labs at the time, there were lots of uh, books and interviews and stuff about the culture of Bell Labs uh, during, say, the 40s to the late 70s. All really interesting. And what they essentially did was just hired very smart people uh, working in, you know, materials, uh, communications, stuff like that. And they gave them a ton of money and said, just research whatever it is you're working on. 
Uh, it's a massive, massive example of undirected research, meaning that it's research without, you know, a product in mind, just research of a, of a principle or a thing that's been noticed with the hope that it will find some practical application later down the line. Um, it was also very accommodating of, uh, of people's ways of working and ways of being. Like introverts weren't forced out into an open plan office and, you know, people who wanted to be social were allowed to be. If you wanted to just shut yourself away in your, in your, in, in your own private office and just work all day and not talk to anybody, you could work like that. It was just very, very sort of accommodating of people's ways of working. So they were very good at getting smart people to come up with smart stuff. And I've got a list of some of the stuff, just a handful of the things that were invented at Bell Labs. So we've got radio astronomy, speech synthesis with a voda, uh, electron diffraction, which laid the foundations for solid state electronics, the photo photovoltaic cell, uh, the transistor, which is probably one of the most important inventions of the 20th century, led to, you know, computers. Uh, information theory by Claude uh, Shannon, which laid, again laid the ground for modern cryptography. Uh, a load of calculators, lots of different kinds of uh, you know electronic calculators, uh, and the charge couple device, which is what captures the light in uh, digital cameras as opposed to film. Uh, later on, that that's between like the forties and the sixties, and then later on, it was mainly computery stuff that they developed. And that's when I get interested because in 1969, Bell Labs invented Unix, if a company can invent a thing. Uh, it's always weird saying individuals invented something like Unix because Unix is an operating system, of course. It's also a philosophy or a bunch of philosophies. It's also just a collection of programs that work together. But the people who are generally credited with inventing Unix are these two. This is... Uh, Dennis Ritchie standing up and Ken Thompson sitting down. There they are, a bit closer. Beautiful pair. Uh, Ken Thompson usually mostly credited with inventing Unix and Dennis Ritchie with inventing the C programming language. The two kind of went hand in hand. Other people were involved, of course. Uh, another significant figure is Brian Kernighan. Videos of him making, giving talks on YouTube and stuff, and they're great. He seems like a genuinely nice fella. You should watch those because he's awesome. Uh, but yeah, so these two were previously working on something called Multix, which was an operating system for a General Electric mainframe that was being worked on by MIT, Bell Labs, and General Electric. But sometime in 1969, this pair got frustrated with the complexity of Multics and started working on, on their own thing, which took the best aspects of Multics, but without the complexity. Uh, and that thing uh, eventually became known as Unix. It was originally released internally in 1971 and announced externally in 1973. It, uh, as I mentioned, it went hand in hand with the C programming language, which was uh, a high level language or a relatively low, a higher level language than, than assembly or machine code that could write, uh, you could write portable code that could be compiled for, you know, more, multiple architectures. So C, C was kind of re revolutionary and that enabled Unix to be what it was. Um, in the early days, use of Unix was mainly constrained to academic and uh, government stuff. And the culture was that People would just write programs and share them with people. They'd share the source code and say, yeah, compile this for your machine, use it however you want to. Um, later on, Unix, uh, Unix was licensed to other parties who could then produce their own version of Linux, including uh, Berkeley, the University of California, uh, Microsoft, who their, their first operating system they released was, it was a, a version of Unix called Xenix. I don't know if it's Xenix or Xenix, but it's with an X. Uh, Sun, who produced SunOS and Solaris, uh, HP with HP UX, and IBM with AIX. So there was a lot of vendors releasing their own versions of Unix, all competing with each other, all making incompatible modifications. It all very quickly got a bit chaotic. Uh, but Unix, incredibly important, incredibly uh, influential on, for example, the, the, the acceptance, the development of the internet because Unix worked often with a, a client-server model and involved lots of network computers, so it, it lent itself to, to the development of the internet. Uh, incredibly important, and 
useful in its in its own right. But all these competing organizations, they all tried to come up with their own standards of how how Unix should work. Uh, and they, they sort of formed groups, but they always ensured that at least one powerful party would be left out and wouldn't like the direction it was being taken in. And they none of them liked the way the others were standardizing it. And it was all a complete mess. Uh, this period was known as the Unix Wars, and it lasted from the mid-80s to 1993, uh, when eventually the IEEE stepped in and the POSIX standard was made, and the POSIX was intended to be uh, a lowest common denominator standard. So rather than each organization standardizing based on their own improvements to Unix, this was this included all of them under the umbrella of Unix and provided a way for them to work together. And there's a graph of all the unices and how they relate to each other. And an important one there is, as I mentioned before, uh, the Berkeley software distribution, Berkeley, Unix, and various names. So Berkeley had a license for the source code of Unix, and they produced their own version of Unix. It was usually students doing operating system research who modified and extended their version of Unix, uh, and they made releases of it. Um, with it, with it completely with AT and T's blessing, uh, starting around 1978. Uh, but this this version of Unix, the the Berkeley Unix, was only available to people who had had a license for the AT and T Unix, because you know licenses, copyright, all that stuff. In the late 80s, it became clear that the Computer Systems Research Group, the CSRG at Berkeley, was going to close. So they made an effort to make their Unix uh, clean of AT&T code. They tried to take all of the AT&T code out of their Unix so that they could just distribute it freely. And they made an effort to do that. They made an effort to strip all the copyrighted code out of it. Uh, unfortunately, AT&T disagreed that they'd removed all the copyrighted code and a lawsuit ensued. Uh, the lawsuit claimed that uh, Berkeley Unix uh, breached USL, that's Unix System Laboratories at, at, at Bell Labs, uh, breached their software license contract, it infringed on USL's copyrights on Unix, it diluted U uh, USL's trademark on Unix, and it misappropriated USL's trade secrets on Unix. Uh, in response to that, Berkeley countersued uh, USL slash um, AT&T slash Bell Labs claiming that they had failed to give credit for improvements that Berkeley had made to AT&T Linux. Uh, and it was an absolute mess. It was all eventually uh, settled out of court in 1993. That's when I, why I say the Unix wars ended there. I'm including this stuff in with the Unix wars. It's just troubles with Unix. And this was all really bad timing because this was just around the time that the internet was starting to get going. So... BSD, well, what became eventually BSD, which is which is now seen as distinct from Unix for the reasons I've just mentioned. They removed all the copyrighted code from it. Uh, they weren't they weren't being used because companies didn't trust them. They they didn't know whether they were going to get sued by AT and T or by Berkeley if they used these various kinds of Unix. They didn't understand the complicated licensing and the way that you know if, if you licensed to berkeley linux you were sort of sub licensing at&t linux and you know terrible awful times for unix and this is one of the reasons why linux took off rather than unix for internet hardware for servers and stuff so that's 1993 uh now we're gonna rewind 10 years to 1983 and we're gonna talk about this man, Richard Matthew Stallman. Uh, Stallman said some dumb shit lately and recently rightly being criticized for it. But before that, he made some massive accomplishments in you know, technology in general, uh, licensing, a bunch of stuff, foundational, multiple achievements. And that's what we're going to be concentrating on here because that's what this video is about. So in 1983, Richard Stallman was working at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab uh, and he came up with the idea of free software and GNU. And GNU irritatingly stands for GNU's not Unix. So GNU, the idea was to be a free software copy, a clone of Unix without all the license problems and the legal issues that you could just freely share with anybody. Uh, and he came up with the idea of free software, which is best expressed uh, through the, the four freedoms, which he defined. Uh, so freedom number one is the freedom to run the program as you wish. 
Number two is study and change the program. Number three is redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor. Number four is distribute copies of your modified code. So you can you can run the program for anything. You can look at the program and change it. You can distribute it to anybody you want and you can distribute your changes. That's what defines free software. But I think the important thing in there is uh, redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor. He could have just said redistribute copies. With the so you can help your neighbor, he's making a moral claim. He's saying that this is ethically, morally virtuous. And I think that's important because the, the the reason for Stallman coming up with the idea of free software is mythologized in a lot of ways. One of the stories you hear is he was trying to work with a printer uh, and he wanted to modify the drivers of the printer to work with a slightly different printer or something like that, but he wasn't allowed to because the manufacturer said, no, these drivers are closed source and proprietary and they contain secrets and blah, 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 blah. And I'm sure all of those other stories are true, but I think what really matters is that Stallman came from an academic culture. So academics and hobbyists at the time, like I was talking about the early days of Unix, they just wrote this code for themselves because it was useful and they shared it with anybody else who might find it useful. It didn't cross their minds to try and make a profit out of them, out of the software, because that's not what they were making it for. They were making it to be useful. And if other people found it useful, that was fucking great. So that's the culture he's coming from. And I think that's important to remember and that so you can help your neighbor thing is important to remember because what that says is, is that Stallman's goals were ethical. Free software is a fairly radical subversive statement of political intent uh, and ethics. It says sharing things is better. It's the right thing to do. That's what's at the center of free software. Uh, to enforce free software, to make it legal, Stallman came up with probably his greatest achievement, his cleverest achievement, which is the GPL, the General Public License. And what the GPL does is encodes those four freedoms, essentially. It, it takes copyright. It says the person who makes this thing uh, holds copyright over this thing, and so they can assert these rights. And so what what, what GPL does, and this is why it's termed copy left, is it takes copyright, it subverts it, turns it on its head and says, anybody can copy this thing, anybody can modify this thing, anybody can redistribute this thing, and anybody can use this thing for any purpose. And that's beautiful. That's really clever. There are some problems that came later from that, and I'm thinking about making a video about that later, but that, at the time, that was a genius idea. It was a way of taking copyright and using it to enforce this, this culture of sharing things for the common good. But anyway... Back to GNU. GNU, as I say, stands for GNU's not Unix. And the idea with GNU was since Unix is a very modular system that's made up of lots of little programs working together, the idea was to make a free software copy of all of those programs. And then eventually you'll have a completely free software Unix system that you can share freely. Anybody who wants to use it can use it. And they, they got a long way. They made most of the system. Uh, they were just lacking a kernel. Uh, they've got the herd kernel. They still have the herd kernel. It's still not really ready for use because it uses a very complicated design. It's a micro kernel that relies on very tight messaging between things, and they can never really get it working. So they had they had most of the Unix, the free Unix system, but they were lacking a kernel. And that's where this man comes into the picture, Linus Torvalds, who on the 25th of August 1991 made a post to a Minix news group saying i'm doing a free operating system just a hobby won't be big and professional like gnu he was referring of course to his linux kernel uh so the linux kernel was originally licensed under a non-commercial line license it was uh, in 1992 relicensed under the gpl so the linux kernel you you could put together with the gnu system and make a complete operating system with a kernel and all of the user space and system stuff that makes a freely distrib distributable, bull, bull, shareable uh, Unix system. Uh, I should probably say, like, Stallman insisting on calling Linux GNU slash Linux. I don't think he's doing that out of self-aggrandizement. He's doing that as aforementioned because he sees this whole thing as an ethical system, as a way of people being good to each other. And he, he feels that without the GNU in there, people aren't going to learn about that. Uh, that battle's lost. Everybody refers to it as Linux, but I don't, I don't think it's. Uh, uh, he's not being a dick. So anyway, we've got we've now got 
GNU slash Linux. We've got the GNU operating system with the Linux kernel. We've got a free software version of Unix that can be shared freely. And of course, it was incredibly successful in a bunch of arenas, not on the desktop particularly, but, you know, internet servers, mobile phones now, arguably, it's uh, been incredibly, incredibly successful. Now we skip forward to the late 90s, to 1998, and to open source. So open source was an initiative. The open source initiative was established by a bunch of people, including Bruce Perrins and Eric Raymond. Bruce Perrins, who was a lawyer who came up with the open source definition. Eric Raymond, who's very good at taking credit for things. Uh, and the, the whole idea was to take free software and make it palatable to business. So they took free software, they came up with the open source definition, and pretty much, I think there are a few exceptions, but broadly speaking, anything that's free software will be open source. Anything that fits the open source definition is free software. They overlap almost entirely. It's just a rebranding. It's just a PR thing to take out the politics, the kind of radicalness, the ethical stuff, and make this you know less hippie-ish and, and more acceptable to business uh and to be fair to them they did a very good job of that as you can see from you know things like the kernel have massive corporate involvement now they get a lot of money and a lot of uh work put into them by corporations which is good in that we get that code but i think it's fair to say it has its downsides as well uh, so, in conclusion, I guess, uh, and this is a critique of the open software, uh, open source movement, really, is we live in a world now where we've got huge corporations like Google, like Facebook, like Twitter, who operate on pretty much entirely free software infrastructure. They use a lot of free software, and they use it to spy on us, to surveil us, to steal all our information and sell it to the highest bidder, which... I think most people, some people wouldn't, but most people, I think, would agree that that is an unethical thing. So we've got this thing that started as an ethical software movement, and now it's been put to, and that's probably its biggest use, is to surveil all of us. And that's a shame. I actually read today a very interesting article about exactly that by the wonderful Wendy Liu, who, who always writes amazing things. I'll link that in the, um, what's it called, the thing beneath this. I can't remember the word for that. Whatever that's called, that'll be there. Um, I'll probably make a, another video that focuses a bit more on free software versus open source. Obviously, I'm a little bit critical of open source. I don't like that rebranding. I think I think the ethical stuff was important, and it's what attracts me to free software. Uh, anyway, I'm babbling, so that's 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 in way of sort of a conclusion. Let's go back to a prettier picture and end this with. The only thing that can reasonably end this video. I love you all. Goodbye. Join us now and share the software. You'll be free, hackers. You'll be free. Join us now and share the software.